Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Portland State University Art and Social Practice Wednesday Afternoon Conversation Series. Today we are joined by uh, Kurt Godey and Kermina Todorova. And Kurt teaches studio art at Transylvania University in Lexington, Kentucky, and makes art to invite conversations about contemporary social issues, from marginalized sexualities to the experience of homelessness. Recently, he has become newly invigorated by plans to reseed the clouds over Kentucky with meat in loving memory of the Kentucky meat reign of 1876. Kermina teaches American literature as well as classes that ask students to meet and work with their neighbors face to face. Born and raised in communist Bulgaria, she continues to draw inspiration for her art and teaching from Timur and his commitment to community. She became an official American on December 10th, 2010. Now, Kurt and Kermina together capture photographs at the periphery of American culture where drag queens, discarded couches, and abandoned motel signs exist. They've traveled to Los Angeles, Indianapolis, New Orleans, and San Antonio to photograph the people who live near the couches and easy chairs found on these cities' curves. The resulting collection of images is part of an ongoing artwork called Discarded USA. With the Lexington Tattoo Project, a public artwork that placed the works of a poem as permanent tattoos on the bodies of 253 Lexingtonians, Ken, Kurt, sorry, Kurt and Kermina have started a movement and are already working with several other cities to launch locally based Pride of Place tattoo projects. Kurt and Kermina have exhibited their collaborative work in Boulder, Indianapolis, Lexington, Louisville, Onenta, New York, San Antonio, and Venice Beach. And we're super excited to have you all with us. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, go ahead and. Uh, Launch in. Do you guys want to talk to us for a little while, and then we'll ask you some questions? Yep. Yeah, we um, we're going to talk about a few projects, and then kind of we'll have spaces for questions, but also you can interrupt at any time with questions. Um, is there anyone who doesn't want to be on YouTube? I only ask that. It seems like a strange strange thing for a social <laughs> practice program. <laughs> some of these folks are kind of visitors, so. Okay. <clears throat> So um, we're going to start very, very briefly talk about um, love locks. Does anybody know love lock fences? Does anyone put a lock on a love lock fence? <clears throat> no. Who, who knows? Who said yes they know? Can you, can you talk about it a little bit? I saw it when I was in Venice this summer. People do it in Europe a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like, only really familiar with it like, on a visual level. I don't really know yeah. the story, but I think the idea is like you get... Um, lock that has a key, and then uh, you lock it to a fence and throw the key as some kind of like symbol of like a, like a, a eternal bond. Yeah, so how perfect is that? You're in a relationship with someone, and you lock yourself to a fence <laughs> with them, and then throw a key in the river. Um, it is very popular in Europe, and popular in Korea. In Korea, they tend not to be fences, but trees, but that's kind of a just a, an anomaly of the, of the same thing. So um, we set up one in Lexington. There are at least three in Portland, um, which you might have seen or might not have seen. Uh, one has all the locks cut off every two months because it makes it so a bridge, uh, gate on the East Esplanade can't open very well, and people then just go and put them on again, I guess, and the city comes along and cuts off all that, that commitment. Um, but the, the idea ultimately is that you know, you clip a lock on with somebody that you're committed to, and this signifies your commitment to them. You're locked to them forever, which is potentially exciting and potentially problematic, locking yourselves to somebody. But um, we set one up in Lexington with a different idea that it's love locks for Lexington, so it's a commitment to the city. Um, but the reason to show that is to, to talk about kind of the model that that uses, um, because that's a model that um, we that both of the projects we're going to talk about use, which is um, kind of a, a, an accumulation of many small actions um, that create something that is much more powerful in the aggregate. So one person locking a lock on a fence and committing themselves to Lexington, or two people locking a lock on a fence, that takes virtually no effort on the part of that person. But when it's filled, you know, it, and then it becomes a fence that looks like this, and this is one in Korea, um, 
So that's a much more powerful statement. And the, the kind of commitment from each individual person is very small. And so we're interested in that kind of aggregate action. Um, we're going to talk about two projects. Um, one of them is called Discarded. And for that, the, the sim it's a real simple act. And that's just agreeing to be part of a portrait of your city. And we're working on that here in Portland. And we're going to ask you for some suggestions on where to go. Um, and all you have to do is sit up for a portrait on a discarded couch. So we'll talk about that. The second project we'll talk about is um, the Lexington Tattoo Project. Um, and the Lexington Tattoo Project is a slightly less simple of, um, is that, I don't know if that's an online question, but slightly less simple act of getting a tattoo. A visible tattoo is a commitment to the city that you call home. So um, we'll talk about Lexington, though it's happening in other cities as well. And two things we want to talk about before we get started is that Lexington has 300,000 people. So it's half the size of Portland, or twice the size of Eugene. Um, it probably feels closer to twice the size of Eugene. Portland seems much larger than Lexington. Um, from, and it's probably just more cosmopolitan in different ways. So, and the other is that uh, at the end, we have a, an eight minute video, which is one of the final products of the Lexington Tattoo Project. So we have things that we want to say, and we'll get to that video, but we hope that you'll ask us questions at any time in the middle um, and stop us. And free feel, feel free to derail us as we go along. Um, but first, we want to talk about this project, which is discarded. And this is something um, that we're working on while we're here in Portland. And we spent yesterday working on it, kind of getting started. And it started with a, a simple idea that I thought was good and Carmen said was terrible which was um, to take a photograph of uh, an old couch which was teetering on top of an even older television. Mm -hmm. So some of you might remember the televisions that were large enough to hold a couch. Um, so on the curb in Lexington, there was one of those televisions with a, you know, like a four cushion couch, so a very long couch on top of it. And I thought it was fantastic. And I, I didn't have my camera. I wanted to take a picture of it. And I mentioned it to Carmenna, but I didn't know why I wanted to take a picture, so I just told her about it. And um, I think her response was something along the lines of, that's a stupid idea. Um, <laughs> no, my, res my response was that, that that's kind of interesting, but it's not enough. Let's just think about it. And so, um, so in terms of what happened uh, next, about maybe two or three weeks later, I was leaving my house. Um, and uh, across the street in front of a house that in my neighborhood we affectionately used to call, not anymore because now it's for sale, but we used to call it the hooligans house. Uh, because some high school students lived there and they smoked pot and drank. Um, so the hooligans house outside of it were placed to really ornate, um, really good looking chairs, cushion chairs, and they were outside to be picked up from the curb. Uh, and I was really struck by these chairs because I, I thought, wow, I would have never imagined the hooligans having this kind of furniture <laughs> inside of their house. And so that got me, and so I had a 10 minute drive. Um, and it, I just kept thinking about that. And I realized we all make assumptions. We're not always aware of them, but we all make assumptions about what's inside of houses based on what they look like, the neighborhood they're in. Uh, and we probably are wrong about a lot of these assumptions. Um, and then I, and I remembered what Kurt had told me about wanting to photograph the couch on the TV. And I thought, well, maybe it will be an interesting idea. <laughs> If uh, when we see a couch or an easy chair on the curb, we go to that house, knock on the door, and try to get one of the former owners to come outside and sit on it. Uh, and at the time, the way I thought about it was as a play between inside and outside, private and public, because we don't. Most of the houses we pass, we don't go into. Um, we have no idea what happens inside. We have assumptions. Wouldn't it be interesting to get one of the people who live inside and used to actually sit on that piece of furniture to come outside and sit on it? in the public space and take their picture. So I called up Kurt and I said, well, we should, I think what we should do is do this knock on doors and photograph people sitting on discarded furniture. Um, and he liked the idea well enough. So that's how it started. It started not a social practice. It started just as a fun idea um, and some questions about assumptions and challenging assumptions. And at the time, we thought what we were going to do was actually document the stories of, of the furniture. And we, would, we thought, OK, we're going to take this picture and ask the people about the story of the couch or easy chair they've put outside. And that was actually in the fall of 2009. And it took us a while to take our first picture. This is the first picture, January 10, 2010. And this is Billy. Um, and this came in a winter much like this winter for Lexington. It had been really cold and overcast and just snow and terrible and awful outside for a long time. And on this day, it was 19 degrees, but the sun was shining. So everyone seemed to be in a, in a good mood. 
and we were driving back from um, actually going to see an exhibition, and we saw this pile of crap, including a couch, um, and we stopped and we were strategizing about how to get anyone to come outside and sit on it in the snow, and then Billy came outside to smoke a cigarette, so we approached him and somewhat sheepishly explained to him what we were doing, and he said, sure, I'll sit on this couch. Um, and so he sat on it and we took the picture, um, and we thought it would be, I don't know why we thought that. We thought, let's write down the address of the piece of furniture, the first name of the person, the date, the time of day, and the temperature. And then we also asked Billy for his email address because we, we said to him, almost as a, as a way to bribe him, we'll send you a copy of your picture. And that became our practice, always asking people for an email address or a mailing address, whatever they were willing to share with us. So this car started in this way, um, and by the time we had taken 10 or 15 pictures, we had developed strategies to persuade people, <laughs> people to come out, actually to come outside and sit on, um, on, um, on the discarded furniture, um, regardless of the weather. So here's another picture taken um, almost a year later on a really cold day. Um, and sometimes, we don't, and we don't have a picture of that at the time, I had a four-month-old um, kit. My son, my son was four months old. Occasionally, I would offer him to people as a bride. I'd say, if you <laughs> if you come and sit on this couch, you can also hold my baby. And it worked occasionally. <laughs> um, when people had tattoos, and you know, this is I'm joking here, but only partly because you you do have to find a way to talk to people and get them comfortable with a very strange request. And coming from me, a woman with an accent, I'm clearly not from Lexington. Um, uh, if people had tattoos, the easiest thing to do would be to say, um, I would love to take a picture of, of your tattoo. Um, and I was pretty comfortable asking uh, men to take off their shirts um, so that we could photograph their tattoos. <laughs> um, and this, then, this never worked as well for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then the previous picture um, is from a, a, a girl we photographed. Uh, very often people liked the idea well enough, but they were camera shy. Um, and so basically they would sacrifice their children. They'd say, I don't want to be photographed, but here's my daughter, she'll come and sit for you. And occasionally the kids look like this, because she, we're not sure that she particularly wanted to be photographed by us, but she came outside and, and, and sat down. Um, sometimes you would tell the people that their um, shoes would match the, um, the house next door really well, um, or just, just make compliment them on what they were wearing. Uh, and then people with dogs were all, are always easy to photograph because we say, come come outside and bring your dog on the couch or on the chair. Um, and so we have a lot of dog pictures as well. And got our first dog picture in Portland yesterday too. Yeah. A dog and baby in the same picture, which is a big coup. Um, so at some point, Karina said we started thinking we were capturing stories of couches because couches have stories. And if you see them on the curb and you know they have big stains, you, you wonder what that is. Um, if you, unless you're a person that just is grossed out by it. Um, but by the time we had captured about 50 pictures, we realized we weren't getting the stories of the couches as we initially had thought, in part because though Billy, the first person we photographed, it was his couch and he loved it and he told us a long story. Often the people we photographed weren't the people who owned the couch. It might have been neighbors or someone who's kind of passing through the neighborhood. Um, and what we did realize is that we were creating a portrait of the city, and the couches then just become an excuse and a reason for us to get out of the car and talk to people. And we realized that, um, you know, largely as we pass through the day and pass through our city, we know the people we work with and the people we live near, but we really have no idea who the people are that make up the city other than that. Um, and as part of this project, we were traveling streets in Lexington that we would have never had any reason to be on. Um, I wouldn't have known before doing this project that there were many streets without sidewalks um, just because they aren't developed in that way. Um, so it was great to see all of that, but then to also realize that um, you know, we're, we're creating a collective portrait of the city through images of people that would never really be photographed for a portrait of the city. So the couches then um, become a community for a vehicle for community building. We had an exhibition at a kind of a warehouse space and the idea for that exhibition was that we wanted the people that we photographed to be very comfortable going because suddenly we were inviting, we were keeping in touch with everyone by sending them pictures and emailing back and forth and um, many of them had never been to an art show and if it seemed like a kind of a more formalized setting they probably wouldn't have gone. Um, but what we ended up with instead was an exhibition where all the images were projected large by season. So these are the ones we took in spring on this screen, four different screens. And people came 
and looked at the looked for their own picture, but also recognized people they knew and recognized the city. Um, and because it wasn't the standard uh, kind of art crowd or art experience where people dress up and come to look and see what other people dress up, and <laughs> if there's art on the wall, that's a happy accident. Um, you know, the interaction was was really uh, special and something that we've tried to do in other cities as well. So other cities, um, since doing this in Lexington, we were invited to do it in Los Angeles. In Lexington, we captured how many? 277. 277 pictures in a year. Um, and largely, those are kind of downtown Lexington, traveling to and from work, and then striking out to try to find pictures that represent the rest of Lexington. Um, and we were invited to LA with the idea that we could get 300 pictures in 10 days. It so was a challenge. It was a challenge, and we couldn't. And the reason we couldn't um, wasn't because there weren't enough couches. There are definitely enough couches. But what happens in each city when we're outside of Lexington, mm -hmm. in Lexington, the, I was rejected a lot. I was turned down a lot. The census had just happened, and I would knock on someone's door, and they would say, are you the census? And I would say no, and I would start to explain the project. And I would say, I'd like to get you to sit on that couch. And their first response would be, are you the census? <laughs> and we've been over this before. Um, Kermena, with an accent, never gets that question. Um, but in other cities, maybe because we're working together, maybe because at that point we understood what we were doing um, more, more clearly, people are really excited to represent their neighborhood. Not just their city, but their neighborhood. So though one picture might take two minutes to take, we sometimes talk for an hour with the people we're photographing. So this is LA in Indianapolis. So um, we choose the part of the city often by recommendations. So first we will kind of drive out from wherever we're located just somewhat randomly, So as we did here yesterday in Portland. And then when we photograph people, we'll say, you know, we're trying to find one neighborhood each day, and where else would you suggest? So then we get suggestions that way. Sometimes in LA, which is so massive, um, we also did a zip code search. And we realized that um, average income above a certain level, couches aren't going to be on the curbs, because people, when they get a new couch, have their old one taken away. And so we know to avoid those neighborhoods, but everything else is, is game. But we don't always avoid them. So uh, Santa Monica, I mean, everybody recognizes privilege when they hear Santa Monica, LA. And we, we found a few pieces there as well. In fact, I think that's always a challenge to not just go to the neighborhoods where we're guaranteed to find the discarded couches, um, but also to go to more affluent neighborhoods and, and see if we're lucky enough to, to see a piece before it's actually taken by someone else. Because if it's a portrait of the city, it should hopefully include people from yeah. different parts of the city. And, and the other thing is people. People, you, we, we are conditioned to not see these couches. They're actually everywhere. Um, I have a, a kind of distant relative who, who works in Hollywood, and he found out that we were out there working in LA, and he said, oh, don't bother coming to Hollywood. There's nothing in Hollywood. And we actually got that message like five minutes after we got two Hollywood pictures. So, you know, depending on where you live, if, if your community has the reputation for this, you probably know they're there. But if it doesn't, we're just conditioned to not see them. It turns out they're, they're almost everywhere, um, and especially in Indianapolis. Indianapolis has a lot of um, urban dumping. There's a big issue with ur urban dumping, so they're scattered throughout the city in a way that um, there was also an architecture exhibit making restructured couches in the living spaces. So all these couches are discarded? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It seems like every person is seeing it in a different Yes. Yeah, so it's, yeah, we just, when we find the couch, we find a person who lives there or works nearby. So what happens, I guess, I mean, so what happens in more affluent neighborhoods where you might not find as many? Well, in I mean, more, my assumption is that you might not right. find Right. In more affluent neighborhoods, when you find them, you have to find them quick. Yeah. And you find them quick because um, they get picked up quickly, right? So the, if the more affluent neighborhoods, if a couch is set out, it's probably going to get picked up at that day. So sometimes in some cities we've actually had, um, so when we were in San Antonio, we had some students kind of with our cell phone numbers and they would just text us if they see a couch that looks like it's going to get picked up. But the same thing happens in, in, in whatever neighborhood we happen to be. When we see a couch or an easy chair, we um, first try to go to the house that, that we assume discarded it, and then we go to a neighbor's house, or we talk to a passerby or if there are workers nearby, and what we tell them is, 
uh, we're here to create a collective portrait of the city of um, New Orleans. This is New Orleans. Uh, we spent each day in a different neighborhood, drive, believe it or not, driving around and looking for discarded couches and easy chairs. And when we see one, we try to, to find someone who lives or works nearby and ask them to sit on it for a portrait. And we're very upfront with people, so we tell them these discarded uh, couches become an excuse or a vehicle for us to be able to talk to very ordinary people that we're not selecting. They just happen to be near near these pieces. Um, and yeah, we have a lot fewer pictures in affluent neighborhoods, but also the, the name of our artwork is discarded, which is somewhat political as well. We didn't want it to be a political artwork, but you can't photograph in the United States and not actually end up with a political or social statement of some of some kind, which which is good. Um, and so, a lot of the time, the people who um, feature in these feature in these photographs are people who, in kind of the traditional discourse about the society, in rendered invisible or pretty easily discarded by mainstream society. Um, we don't try to only take those pictures, uh, but these pictures are important to us. Um, and it was really difficult for us to photograph in New Orleans. We went there because, um, again, we, we knew someone there, and she asked us to go out and photograph. It was really, really hard. Although we, we see urban poverty in any city we go to. We, we've seen it now here in, in Portland as well. And, and it was very hard to be in New Orleans because it was so obvious that um, I mean, the same thing we know about American society as a whole, that, that race and class really work against you in this society, despite uh, the rhetoric of the American dream, more so in New Orleans and more so after Katrina. Uh, and there were so many neighborhoods that we had all heard about um, were really damaged by Katrina. And to see those people whose lives are uh, still pretty bad and probably will better than where they were when we were photographing them, it was really hard. Um, and so then that becomes a commitment for us to actually showing these showing these images and um, um, you know we write down our conversations with the people so we also have stories uh, from a lot of these encounters uh, and finding a way to share the images and the stories not just with that community but with with other communities where we show these images uh, so it, it it becomes the commitment to in a way giving voice voices to these people um, and one of the yeah. things we learn in every city. Now, Indianapolis is a good example of a city that we went to not with not with great feelings about, right? So we didn't expect to love Indianapolis. <laughs> but what we find in every city That's is... That's an understatement. Yeah. <laughs> I we, thought Indianapolis was just a terrible city. Because I went to university um, at Notre Dame, which is in northern Indiana. So I'd gone kind of on the highways around Indianapolis a number of times. And I always thought it was a, just a terrible, boring Midwestern city. Um, and what, you know, what we find is that People who live in their city love it. You know, everyone, um, whether it's justification or the just lived experience, people really come to love their city. And hearing people talk about the great things about their city, at the same time that they're also saying to us, "Make sure you get out of this neighborhood by dark." Um, but, <laughs> but um, talking about the things they love about their city is really powerful and moving. And there are many people. I shouldn't say many. There are some people in each city. In fact, in this picture, the woman on the bottom right is one of them. Um, that when we talk to them to take their picture, they actually ask us to come back. So they'll say, you know, I'll sit on that picture. She said, I'll sit on that chair for you, but I need to do my hair and makeup and put on a special outfit. Um, and that the first place that never happened in Lexington, and I think because we're pitching it differently because we live in Lexington. Um, but the first place it happened in was in LA. LA, and a woman was Ethiopian and she wanted to go in and put on her traditional outfit. Mm -hmm. So she was wearing her traditional <clears throat> Ethiopian clothing and her son who just got home was wearing his jeans and t-shirt. Yeah. Um, so that's, that becomes an interesting part of it is that people are, are proud to represent Yeah, and the woman on, on the bottom right there, um, so that's in the lower ninth ward, both that picture and the picture in the top left uh, in the lower ninth ward. She stepped and went, so this couch was in the house facing her house. She had left New Orleans after Katrina for three years and then she came back. And from our point of view, we kept wondering why would anyone want to live in New Orleans? Um, a lot of blight, a lot of potholes. If anyone has been there, like really deep, I don't know how many feet, but deep. <laughs> You could not only destroy your car, but lose it yeah. in, the, in the potholes. Potholes, and then the weather is, is um, ex a weather of extremes, and then you can always get flooded. And so we, we really wondered, why would anyone want to live in the city? And people love the city and the community. And this woman in the lower ninth ward, given that the house across from hers is boarded up, and pretty much every other house was boarded up or just like torn down, 
um, she said she loves she loves the city and she loves her, the sense of community. It's where she's from, and so it's really it's really moving to hear those stories, and it really humanizes. I mean, it humanizes the people and the cities for us. Um, including cities as different as Indianapolis, which I mean, I don't know how many people in this country care about Indianapolis or Lexington, New Orleans. We all know about New Orleans. We all know about LA, uh, but this is a very different way to to experience these cities. Um, so, yeah. So then, our commitment to each of these cities um, becomes pretty strong after we photograph, and then that's San Antonio. Carina, yes. So I have a quick question. Uh, you mentioned that by kind of going on these journeys through the communities, you've been able to notice things about cities. Um, you know, you're saying the potholes or different things. Are are you ever ever able to make connections between your observations and maybe policymakers or local government or any other things like that in the communities you're working in? Or has that not even been a a, a part of it? You know, that's um. New Orleans is actually the only city that we've exhibited. We haven't exhibited the photos in that we've photographed. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons for that actually is because we were very cautious about where we exhibit them. And the quick answer to your question is no, we haven't made those connections. But um, with New Orleans, there's, there's so much um, kind of photography and, and art made around destruction. Mm -hmm. And we're try, trying to figure out how to have an exhibition that, that can bring the community together. And it's not just another um, artwork about the destruction of Hurricane Katrina. And it was also hard to take pictures that were avoiding that kind of mm -hmm. sensationalism. Um, and one of the things we started to do in New Orleans through the connections that we have is, is connect with kind of community development corporations and um, organizations that we hope. And one of the things that we offer is that um, the ability to use the pictures for, you know, kind of, um, and renaissance isn't the right thing, but, but civic pride. So it's something that we're aware of, um, I think more so in New Orleans because of how we've been approaching it. Yeah, but so it hasn't, we haven't made those connections at any point yet. Thank you. I have another question. Sure. Yeah. Um, do you guys ever record audio of like when you're talking with people? Or like what process do you yeah. use to keep those oh, stories? Yeah. That's right. yeah. We have um, primarily. As soon as we're done talking to them, we actually take a few notes that, um, if I'm writing, they're hard to read um, as we're talking. But um, And that's one thing that's great to have two people. So one of us can be talking while the other one's taking notes. Um, and we keep a big Google document with all that information. Um, in some of the cities, we've included some of those narratives in the exhibition. In um, LA, we actually had oral history interviews with three or four different people. Um, when we went back to create the exhibition. Mm -hmm. But you still just did like paper? No, for those we recorded. You did, okay. yeah. yeah. And we, we had them sign permission um, right. for the oral history interviews. But and and we, yeah. we, have, um, we have another artwork we did, I guess we started about five or six years ago, that was based in oral histories. So um, there's an oral history commission in the state of Kentucky. It's one of the, maybe the only state with one a state-funded oral history commission. Mm -hmm. So. You know, when we recorded those interviews, we kind of went through that kind of standard process mm -hmm. of archiving and stuff. Is that an Apple Shop? Apple no, Apple Shop is, is separate from that. Mm -hmm. yeah. How do you choose the sites where you hold the exhibitions? And um, do you invite other audiences or is it <laughs> Well, we, it's, it's imp so um, in Lexington, we, we were very intentional because we really wanted the space that a lot of the people we photograph who are, you know, not all of them, but a lot of them are people who live in um, working class neighborhoods, probably don't go to art exhibitions. I go to art spaces that, that are clearly meant to make me feel intimidated or even though, even if they're not meant to, they could make people like me, educated people, <laughs> intimidated. So we were very aware that most traditional art spaces would not be great for, um, for with for this intention. So we um, exhibited them in a gallery, or showed them in a gallery, which is uh, an old warehouse, actually within a neighborhood where most pizza restaurants in Lexington will not deliver, because they think it's too dangerous, which it isn't, but uh, it's a predominantly African-American working class neighborhood, and so the rhetoric then is, is too dangerous. And so we, um, so, peop so a lot of the people just walk there, people from that neighborhood. Um, in, when we, ex 
created an installation in, in LA, we actually turned the lobby of a hotel, which is right on Venice Beach, on the boardwalk, in Venice Beach on the boardwalk, we turned it into our exhibition space. We created a, um, a gallery uh, in there. And so, the we, because it was really important for us that the boardwalk community would be welcome, and they actually were welcome. Um, and, and a lot by, of them by came. By boardwalk in. community, there's a large community yeah. of home free people. Yeah. Um, in Indianapolis, it was different because we were invited to the artwork there, and so that was in a standard gallery. So it was a very different kind of experience. It was at the University of uh, Indianapolis, is that what it's called? Heron Art School. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then in, uh, in in San Antonio, it was uh, a show at UTSA, um, University and, of Texas. And San, San Antonio, so that, that exhibition in particular was also too far from downtown. Mm -hmm. So one of, the, one of the great things about this exhibition is that we do keep in touch with as many people as we can, and we send them their pictures, and, and an um, invitation. we send them an invitation either through mail or Facebook, and in some cities we ask people to change their profile picture to the picture that we took, so it, it kind of builds mm -hmm. this Facebook buzz about it. Um, but in um, San Antonio, what happened was that the, the gallery space was too far from downtown, mm -hmm. and so I don't know how many people that we photographed ended up mm -hmm. there. Um, so. You know, it's not always uh, the best solution. We have a lot less control in other cities. So by far the best experience was in Lexington because we, we are from Lexington, well, we are not from, but we live in Lexington. Um, we And we were able to create a lot of publicity for it on Facebook and just um, by connecting with the people who had photographed. So a lot of the people who we photographed mm -hmm. came. And it was a really it was really a powerful experience for us to, to see them, their kids and their parents and the older people, people who took buses to get there. Uh, and it really became a celebration, well celebration, it really became a communal gathering of a lot of different kinds of people, not just the people who we now recognize at all the galleries and art shows uh, in the downtown area. Um, but we have less control in other cities. So what's your connection here in Portland or your goal for Portland um, for this project? Yeah, we, we haven't actually found a location yet. One, one of the things that's it's been really fun in some cities, and it might happen here as well, is finding locations through people that we photograph. Um, one of the locations we considered in LA was uh, an old warehouse by, that where a furniture work, furniture artist did his work, um, because it was a uh, in La Brea. It was in La Brea, which was a neighborhood we photographed a lot in. And so, as we're talking to people, we'll talk about that and. And hopefully, in the most ideal situation, you know, we make a connection with somebody we, that we photograph, mm -hmm. who has um, kind of a access to a space and a, an awareness and kind of uh, sympathy to what we're yeah. trying to do. Yeah, and you know, that's only part of it. So another, the flip side of that is, and uh, we'll tell the story, even though this will be on YouTube, so it could get us in trouble. But we tried to photograph in Boulder, Colorado, for this artwork because we were there to work on this other artwork, the, the two projects, which we'll tell you about. And we figured what better way to get to know a city than by traveling all day long around neighborhoods and talking to ordinary people near discarded couches. And the first day we, we worked on discarded in Boulder, we only saw three pieces. And th that was it in the whole city of Boulder, which if you've been to, has anyone been to Boulder? Mm -hmm. It's small and it's very homogenous. So it, it, it once we had been there for a few days, we realized it was no surprise <laughs> that, that we didn't find more discarded couches or easy chairs. But what was interesting is that um, we felt like a lot of people who live in Boulder are not aware that other people elsewhere in the country have very different lives. Um, and so like, we would hear all the time people saying that they think that pretty much everybody will be on a gluten-free diet very soon because that's the way to go and that's obviously the, a healthy lifestyle. And we're thinking gluten-free, I mean, you have to... You have to have access to, to money to begin with to be worried about your gluten-free diet. But but that was kind of the rhetoric there. Of course, you know, you, you're well exercised, you don't eat gluten, it's all natural, farm to table, like that is the right way of life but that we're all headed towards in the next two years. And we <laughs> yeah, and we and we realize, you know, it might it might be that these the discarded images could have a lot more impact in a place like Boulder. So that they see that a, a lot of parts of the country, people <laughs> elsewhere in the country, don't live the kinds of privileged lives that a lot of Boulderites live. Uh, so discarded could not happen in Boulder. And before we came to Portland, we were doing a little bit of research. I was concerned that Portland would be just like Boulder, and that it would be homogenous and white upper class privileged. And people assured me it wasn't, and and but people would also make jokes about Portlandia, yeah, right? Portlandia doesn't really, necessarily which I haven't seen, thankfully. 
Uh, but what we saw yesterday at Portland was not what I have heard Portland is about, which is great. Um, so here are a couple of images we, we um, got yesterday. Yeah. Can I ask another question? Yeah. What, what, how do you perceive the tension of like representing people in a way that's dignified and reinforcing um, ideas around their poverty and what they don't have access to and what they lack? And also, just picking back on that because I think it's kind of related, just the name, discarded, yeah. uh, uh, you could apply it to the couches, you could apply it to yeah. the people too, so there's like some danger there also yeah. of representation. There, with the yeah, there's... So we have that conversation actually with a lot of the people that we photograph. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have a business card we give them that says "discarded" on it. Um, they often see that card before they sit for the the, the picture. And there are certainly people that say, um, you know, I, I guess actually this tension became the most pronounced in Lexington. Um, there are people who say, you know, I don't make it very clear they don't want to be represented in that way because they're they're aware that "discarded" could be applied to the people too. Um, so. The, but the other question was how we deal with the tension between um, basically voyeurism or you know a dignified way of, of creating a portrait, and we you know the way we talk about that when we're taking the pictures and then um, in talking about them later is that you know in almost all of our pictures the people are looking at the camera and and what we tell them is we tell them about the project and we say we only have one prompt and that prompt is that you look comfortable you know you you. Treat this as if you're in your in your living room, and and that um, from our our way of thinking about it is that way of approaching the picture and giving them, you know, we think of them very much as collaborators, and when those conversations happen longer, um, we tell them that. So it's it's about the way that they want to present themselves. So there are certainly times when um, some people will say, you know, I don't want to be photographed next to that dumpster, and so we we crop that out. More that. often than not, it's white people. It's white privileged people who say, I don't want to be on a discarded couch. I don't want to be associated with a piece of furniture. But it's not very often that that happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but that's why it's, it's, it's important that we don't go just to the neighborhoods where we can anticipate to find a lot of couches. It's important that we we try, we, we do our best to go to, to, to find couches in, in all different kinds of neighborhoods because we really want this to be I mean, what is representative? Nothing is representative, but we do want people included from different neighborhoods and in, in, in different walks of life. Um, yeah, and people can always say no if they if they don't want to participate. Um, and the fact that there is um, there are a lot more other people who become part of the portrait. It's not just one person, or it's not like five people from the same neighborhood. Um, we think that um, there is. Um, there's a lot of diversity in these pictures, or a lot of like different different people in, in, in different houses and backgrounds. So, do you have a goal for Portland? How many portraits? Um, based on what we took yesterday, I would say our goal would be probably ten to twelve a day, right? Mm -hmm. A day, yeah. How long? We're here for a week, yeah. and we might come back in the fall mm -hmm. because we applied to. <laughs> to go to an, um, an academic conference and we figure if we get accepted, our school will pay for us to travel here again and we can take more pictures in the fall when the, um, the background will be different mm -hmm. and we'll know the city better, so we'll, we'll know better where to go or go to areas that we didn't go to this time. So did you choose to come to Portland or did somebody invite you? Were you invited to speak here or? Well, we, yeah, we, had, we talked to Mark, we met Mark in um, mm -hmm. San Antonio and you know he, he suggested Portland could be interested, and uh, we also mentioned it with an awareness of this program, and you know, an interest in that. We teach a yeah. class called together called Community Engagement Through the Arts, which is um, Transylvania, where we teach a small liberal arts college, a thousand students, and it's it's safe to say it's very traditional. I was going to say fairly traditional, but very traditional would be um, a kind of a better way to mm -hmm. to state it. And so that class um, is. is quite a ways outside of what's regular there. Um, so we've been interested in this program for a while and you know, coming out here was, was an interest for that. So when we met Mark, yeah. it was We kind of also have connection. wanted to photograph in the, in the Northwest and we still, we're still missing a city in the Northeast. We think we'll go to Boston in the Northeast. So um, this, it, it seemed to fit well, the size of the city and the location as well. Kurt, Kurt do you guys have plans to talk today about CETA and what y'all are doing? Um, no but, we, no, but we can. I think it'd be really interesting at some point um, to talk about, because you guys have been doing that for like seven years now, right? 
Yeah, and we're um, and the week when we get back, we're going to break a world record, which will be fun. So I think it's fun. You know, I grew up with the Guinness Book of World Records every year and trying to imagine what I would do to get into it. <laughs> and for many years, I thought it would be sitting on a stalagmite because that seemed like the easiest one. It was just, it was just like 43 hours. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll talk about that. And we'll talk about the the record we're going to get. But okay. that class we teach community engagement through the arts. Um, the class meets in a neighborhood that's, um, I mean, now it's becoming gentrified. We talked about neighborhoods like this here in Portland. But traditionally, it has been a neighborhood that's been considered dangerous because it's working class, mostly African American. And so we, uh, we, we and we can talk about this later. We teach it. We, we the class meets there. We make art with people who work, go to school, or, um, or live in that neighborhood. So um, we're, we're very sensitive about issues of poverty pimping. Somebody used that phrase once um, in relation to something else, like the dangers of just going into a place and as a total outsider and, and taking stuff or taking pictures and then leaving. Um, so we're always we're always sensitive about that and trying not to become poverty pimpers. Um, and um, and when we think about discarded, the fact that it's um, that we go in a lot of different neighborhoods, that we take pictures that we think of as um, yeah dignified pictures. People arrange themselves on those pictures. We we have conversations with them. We we write down their stories. Um, we yeah we hope that all of that. Um, prevents us from doing uh, what we don't want to do, which is poverty pimping. Well, when you bring them together in a collective mm -hmm. way and mm -hmm. celebrate mm -hmm. their connection to the city. They're, and they're, they're being a part of the city, which is mm -hmm. in the standard um, narratives, they're not often not part of the city. Mm -hmm. The other thing that, um, that we do, and I think it's probably something that's talked about here with some regularity, is um, you know, we have a, by virtue of being college professors and, and also artists, we have a very clear platform from which to mm -hmm. speak, and um, you know we're photographing the people whose stories they are don't necessarily have a platform to speak from. And so, with this project, with <clears throat> another project we did with uh, drag queens in Lexington, um, and and also with the tattoo project, which we'll talk about in a minute, it's we think about that a lot, and we feel a great responsibility for sharing those stories in a way that that does honor to them. Um, because when people talk to you for an hour about their neighborhood and why they love it, um, you know that's an incredible gift, and it, it's hard um, to kind of get around the fact that they they gave this to you, um, and then we have an ability to share it that they might never have, and so that's something that that we're conscious of frequently. You know, we think about that a lot. Whether or not we always kind of come to a resolution that that makes that clear is is certainly questionable, but. Um, with with this project, the ongoing discarded project, um, we think of it as a larger project that will come together and discard the USA after one more city. So in that point, then we start to really think about how how best to to do honor to the stories that we've been given around the country. Okay, we're gonna move on to tattoos. <laughs> So um, this is a really large tattoo. Yeah, this is a big tattoo. So this is actually yeah, it's a um, it's a mural. Um, I don't know if you've seen it. Owls and oh, that's across from yeah. Owls Park. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so um, so we've been doing work in the Lexington community for a number of years, um, and we'll tell you how kind of where the Lexington tattoo project came from, as much as we can trace it. Uh, but this something happened. Well, something happened in in the fall of. Um, 2012, we ended up hosting two street artists from Germany who go by the name of Herkut. Um, uh, if you've seen their work, they, most of their work is on the coast, uh, east coast and west coast. We encountered their two big murals in Culver City, LA, uh, when we were in LA to show this card at LA, and we really loved their work. Um, and we, and at the time, there were no big murals in Lexington, and we, we kind of thought, wouldn't it be great to to have them come and do murals in Lexington, which seemed like something totally unachievable. And we tried to go the traditional route. We found out that there is a gallery in San Francisco that carries the gallery work. So we emailed the gallery director. And that seemed to go someplace, but then it didn't go anywhere. Um, and then so we figured, well, we can't get in touch with Herrick, but we should move on to the, the next street artist on our list. 
But before we give them up completely, just to be on the safe side, let's say, send them a Facebook message, just to make sure that they actually will not come to Lexington mm -hmm. before we ask someone else. So I sent a message to, to, to their Facebook um, uh, page. And they responded. Uh, and in the Facebook message, I always said, was, we live in Lexington, Kentucky. We love your work. We'd love to host you here in about uh, 18 months. Could you tell us what, what you would charge, what your honorarium is, so that we have enough time to raise money to bring you? And the response they sent us was, great. We'd love to come to Lexington. We will not cha charge you an honorarium, but we'll come in three weeks. <laughs> and so we had, the two of us had three weeks to raise $9,000, which actually only went to pay their traveling expenses from Germany. They live in Germany. Um, it's, it's two street artists. They go by the made-up name of Herkut. Um, so we, we had three weeks to raise $9,000 to pay for the expenses, host them, buy all, all the spray paint and just paint, um, and also um, rent two forklifts. That was the most expensive part of it. And, and find know, walls. And find walls, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was a lot of work for, to do in three weeks. We felt like our hair could completely took over our lives for three weeks. Uh, but when they came to town, they painted two murals. This is one of them. This is the other one. And the painting of the murals, um, it took them four days to do the two murals. Uh, it became a community event. We created. A, we had so little time to advertise they coming to town. They, we didn't even bother about the print media. We created a Facebook uh, page called Haircut in Lexington exclamation point, um, and that's how people found out about it. And so all day long, this is right in the downtown area by farmers market. So all day long, there would be kids from local schools coming by, people on lunch break coming to check out what's going on, or just walking by. And some people just became regular, so they would um, they would come over with a blanket and and a cooler of beer, and people would bring food to the artists. And so for five days, Lexington was just a glow with this visit by street artists, given that a lot of people until then had no idea street art even existed, let alone be interested in it. And so by the time Herrick would left, um, we realized a few things. Um, we realized that something we already were aware of, that there is a lot of love for community and energy to build community in Lexington. We realized that uh, people, there are a lot of people who, who want to support art and actually be part of art. Um, and we realized that there is also money, that there are private individuals who will, will give money for art to happen, which was great. <laughs> and that became kind of the final impetus for us to work on the Lexington Tattoo Project, which we had been thinking about for a while, but at this point we knew we, we are ready to, to start working on that. Can I ask about the mm -hmm. perspective? Sure. Three weeks, so you didn't have to get any permits for that. Just the building owner, or so, yeah. it depended on the building we chose. <laughs> this building, if it had not been painted, we would have needed a lot of permits. Mm -hmm. But in the downtown development area um, in Lexington, the rule is if there's already paint on a brick building, it doesn't matter what paint goes on it next, whether it's a flat color or a picture. Um, this other one is outside of that district, and mm -hmm. so it's not connected to any of that, and it's not a city-owned building. So we learned all of that in, yeah. in less than three weeks. We learned a lot of things in three weeks, but yeah. that was one of them. Yeah. Can you um, go a little bit deeper into why you chose these particular graffiti artists? Yeah. Sure. You don't have to do this minute. You can do it later. Sure. Yeah. OK. I think we can do yeah. it now. So, um, we, we really liked the murals that we saw. And um, Lexington has no street art. Um, what Lexington does have is um, a few taggers. Um, now it has actually quite a bit of street art because this then made some other people realize that they could bring international artists in. Um, but what we do have are some taggers. And we were interested in having artists come in that would make images that were, that were fun, that didn't seem uh, mm -hmm. necessarily overtly or politically challenging. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And what we, what we realized in first talking to Heroku, um, and the reason they wanted to come in three weeks is they were getting ready to start a um, global storybook, I think mm -hmm. it's called, mm -hmm. International Storybook Project. Where So these are the first two pages of a children's book that they're writing um, or they're illustrating um, on buildings all over the world. So we kind of liked the images that they had done. Um, we liked that their work, they make work for galleries and for the street. And the reason we liked that is that we knew that in Lexington, um, if we brought someone in that, that didn't have the ability to also engage the art, the more traditional art scene and the gallery scene, that mm -hmm. um, we would be losing a lot of support that we needed. Um, because there had been some vandalism and 
we wanted to stay mm -hmm. as far away as we could from, from that conversation. So two years later, this year, we're trying to, we actually are bringing another street artist to create a large mural, and in this case, it's Andrew Hamm, and he's a new, well, a new, a fairly young uh, artist. Again, we saw his work in Culver City, and, and in this case, from our point of view, it's a lot more political, and we've been upfront about that, and it might be a little bit harder to find walls for his work, but he's um, Asian American, and the work that we've seen, the murals he does, are um, kind of melancholy, sad-looking um, figures of people that but the people are distinctly recognizable as Asian or Asian American. And we really like the idea of having murals of non-white people in downtown Lexington. Already we've talked to one wall owner, great location for the wall, and the wall is really well primed and everything, and we were upfront with him about that. We said, you know, we invited Heracle because we like their images and they were very user-friendly. Um, although some people don't like them, but that's fine. Uh, but it seemed like there was nothing, I mean, there is nothing political about their work, there, there actually are political implications to inviting an Asian-American artist who um, creates portraits of Asian American people, um, and we, we we like that. We think Lexington needs that because um, there isn't a large Asian American population. There is a big Latino community in Lexington, African American community, um, and we think it's important to have um, murals of non-white people. Last year, four different uh, street artists were brought by a street art festival that's now in its third year. Uh, and the biggest mural they, one of them created, which is very loved by Lexingtonians, is of Abraham Lincoln. So it's a really huge, Cobra is the muralist, uh, really, um, really big mural of uh, Abe Lincoln, uh, which is which is great, but um, he's a white man, uh, an old white man, and <laughs> so we, um, yeah, anyhow, I won't go into politics there, but anyhow, we, in, so we, we feel Lexington is now ready to have a, kind of different kind of uh, street art. That's one more question. Yeah. You mentioned that uh, you realized that there were people in the community that wanted to support the arts mm -hmm. based on bringing this, yeah. uh, this mural there. Did they come to you and say, I yes. want more of this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm willing to fund? The, or? the fantastic thing was they didn't say, I want more of this. They said, basically, we have more money, what do you want to do with it next? Yeah, what's next? And um, so we were in a situation where people <laughs> wanted to give us money to do something that engaged the community, in part because they really liked the way that these two street artists, you know, Kamara said they painted each mural in two days. They could have done them each in a day. They are really fast. The reason it took them two days is because they never painted at the same time. One of them would be painting and the other one was entertaining, you know, a crowd of up to 50 people. And so um, that kind of way of making art connected to the community, um, especially the parts of the community that don't often connect to art, was really exciting to people. And so, yeah, the offer we got was essentially we have more money, what are you going to do And it's never money for the two of us. So yeah. like we've, we've never made yeah. any money. but. Uh, which is which is fine. We have our jobs. Uh, it is it is money though to invite other people to or to work with other people to make art that's uh, participatory and that's exciting for people in Lexington. So then we had we, you know, we met with one of them. His name is uh, Price, and we'll show a picture of him in a little bit, <laughs> and told him this idea we had about the Lexington Tattoo Project. And in in short, you know, this idea came up. It came about after. We've been working together on the class, community engagement through the arts, but also on our own artwork for about seven years. Yeah. And so when people ask, and I'm sure you, this will make sense to you, when people ask where an idea starts, it's really hard to know where it starts. We can make up a narrative about where exactly it started, but often it's, it's made up because it starts in so many different ways and it finally comes together. And this came together when we heard a local poet, Bianca Spriggs, read at a, at a poetry reading, because she reads so powerfully. Um, and anything that she reads is moving. So we kind of took that awareness and, and applied it to this project we've been thinking about anyways and realized the perfect kind of voice um, for this project would be a love letter that she wrote to the city of Lexington. Um, so that in the end it's a video of her reading with words from her poem um, divided up as tattoos. <laughs> And so we talked, we kind of briefly outlined that to... Uh, and before you go further, I should say that um, a lot of um, I mean, the discarded idea in this, a lot of our artworks don't start with the idea of necessarily 
engaging the community or engaging it in all the ways that we end up engaging it, they, they, for us they start as fun ideas. Wouldn't it be fun if? Uh, and we respond to things that we see in our environment, whether it's the built environment or in human environment. Um, and so in, with the Lexington the two project, we, it's, it's, yeah, it started as, as a, our wondering how we could capture people's love for Lexington in Lexington. Mm -hmm. And then subsequently we realized it's another artwork about stories, about people's personal stories. But that, that came came later uh, at the time. But I wanted to put that up front that when, now when we think about this artwork, we think of it as a conceptual artwork that, that, that involves stories, commitment to Lexington and skin and poetry and tattoos. But really it is, it is about personal stories um, um, that are very personal that people hardly ever share with others uh, or with people outside of their family. And then stories that are a lot more public than that. And we think of it as ultimately as, as an artwork about the story we now tell of, of Lexington and of us in Lexington. Ten years ago, and, and you maybe can respond to this as well, it would have been really hard to find, say, 10, 15 people in Lexington and say they love Lexington, and they're really proud to call themselves Lexingtonians. <laughs> um, now, within the past five to seven mm -hmm. years, that's changed a lot. And I think that might not just be Lexington. I think a lot of cities are having that kind of um, resurgence in civic pride. But in Lexington, there, there are a handful of reasons for it. Um, some developers tore down a, a block in downtown Lexington to build a, a, a skyscraper, high-rise um, hotel. And a lot of uh, young people who are committed to Lexington came out to fight it. And as a result, it's just been an empty field for a number of years. Um, but that galvanized a lot of people's awareness of the fact that they aren't the only people who are proud to be, live in Lexington. And so this artwork is, is partially using that growth in civic pride as, as, a, as a material. Um, and this is a picture of Ann Brown. And we'll, we'll tell you her story. We'll share a few of the stories with you um, as we kind of talk about a little bit more about the project. So these these are um, this is actually John and Jessica and they're the founders of the street art festival that that, that brings in um, the international street artists now after we brought in Heraku. Um, this is the title of the poem. So the blank of the universe a love story. The way Bianca wrote it um, after talking to us and we commissioned her to write the poem was actually also going out to Facebook and trying to get as much input as possible. So she put two things on on Facebook. One of them was, um, help me fill in the blank, Lexington is the blank of the universe. And she has a large Facebook presence, so a lot of people sent in suggestions. And the other was, um, what are your favorite kind of unsung places in Lexington? And we'll show you in a minute how they show up in the poem. So I mentioned um, Price Nickel before. And he's uh, someone that we connected with mm -hmm. um, through the Heracoop mural and through mm -hmm. other projects. Uh, this is Price. His, his head's not there. You probably wouldn't recognize him anyways. Um, but if you did, he looks a lot like this, but with a head. Um, <laughs> Price, when we first told him the idea, he asked us how much it would cost. And thankfully, we had just talked to a tattoo artist. Mm -hmm. We found a tattoo artist by looking at everyone who had text tattoos mm -hmm. in Lexington. And we saw sharp everyone ones, not this. everyone. Yeah. Everyone we saw that had a really sharp text tattoo, we asked them where they got it. And most of the time they said Robert Lean, one person. So, I mean, partially that tells you a little bit of the size of Lexington, right? If you did that in <laughs> Portland, it wouldn't come down to one person. Um, <clears throat> but so when we had already talked to Robert about it, he loved the idea because he, he was very interested in a community-based um, project with tattoos. And so we knew it would cost about $3,000 to get 100 tattoos. We mentioned this to Price, and Price said, that's great, I'll cover that. And we were committed to making the tattoos free for participants, because we wanted uh, we wanted the only commitment people had in participating um, to be a commitment to the city of Lexington, not a monetary commitment as well. And we knew that for a lot of people, um, it's expensive to, to pay for a tattoo. So yeah, we yeah. said we need $3,000 to make a hundred tattoos free to participants. And this goes back to the love locks. So their commitment is pretty small in relative to other cat tattoos. They just have to be able to say, I want it, I love Lexington enough to wear this, and then let us photograph it. And Price said he would cover all of it. We thought that was fantastic. Um, Bianca's published poems, she had two books of poetry already, were 100 words long, so we figured $3,000 will cover all of them. 
And then she submitted this poem to us on the deadline we gave her, which was Thanksgiving, and it's 500 words. So all of a sudden, our project cost five times as much, or we had to find some way to sort it out. And in the meantime, we had set up a Facebook page where anyone who was interested in joining, if they click join on Facebook, we assumed that meant they wanted a free tattoo. <laughs> Um, and we had around 200 people, a little over 200 people. In spite of the fact that around at about 100 people, we pleaded with them to stop joining because we didn't know if we would have enough tattoos. And that just, because Facebook works virally, that just made them join faster. Um, <laughs> so we had two days to turn this around because we had promised people the Sunday after Thanksgiving that we would make the phrases available for them. And by this point, everyone's really excited about it. And knew that it was first come, first serve with the phrases. Um, and what we ended up doing was dividing them into smaller phrases rather than individual words and kind of matching the number of participants we already had, which was mm -hmm. around 230. Mm -hmm. um, so in the end, it's 253 words, um, 253 tattoos. And everybody was asked to submit their top three phrases, top three choices. Mm -hmm. Of 253 people, only 18 people had to resubmit because they didn't get one of the top three choices. And, um, you know, that's in spite of the fact that there are some phrases here that would be difficult, we imagine, to be someone's top choice. Um, but as it turns out, because of what we'll end up talking about is the way that, that people embrace this project and make it their own and take any small phrase and understand the way that that is really powerful and meaningful to their own lives, that has nothing to do with the poem itself often. Um, almost everything became someone's first choice or one of their top three choices. So this is some of the ones that we thought would be more difficult. The armpit, the errant nipple hair. We thought for sure nobody would want this one. Um, this woman actually, was she in Oregon? She was in Oregon. She yeah. was in Oregon at the time. She's a hasher, if you know what hashing is. They are drinkers with a running problem. So they um, run from, they're drinkers with a running problem. That's how they identify themselves. What does it mean? That um, they run from bar to bar and yeah. basically run to drink. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and they collapse all in, internationally and all over the country. And it's a tight network. So she goes and visits people in different <laughs> places in the US. And now she's going to Finland, I think. She's going to Finland. And she stays with people who are part of this. Yeah. Clubs. They literally run to 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 bars. Yeah. They'll run from one bar to another. They give them. They give each other vile names, just much like roller derby. Gives each other. You know, they have these special names. Hashers have special names, and then they um, drink at one bar and race to another bar. <laughs> and I think they actually send a rabbit out. Is that? I don't know. If that's I think what. it's made up that okay. there is a rabbit. Well, there's one person who has to lead a trail, and everyone else has to chase. Thing, right? yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very English. So she was here. She was here, and she was here in Oregon at the time, hashing. Um, and she sent us a message saying that she really wanted to be part of this project, but since she was out of town, she would take whatever phrase nobody else wanted. And we said, "Great, we'll get back to you in a week." <laughs> <clears throat> and the next day, I thought that's potentially cruel. Because there must, there might be some she just can't take, and Kermina said she does doesn't care. She already told us she'll, she'll take, take the last one. <laughs> She's a hasher, <laughs> and I, I said, you know, so we decided to send her a message and say, <clears throat> well, what about, you know, will you really take anything? For example, would you take the errant nipple hair? And her response, you know, her name's Heather, and Heather sent a message back saying, actually, that was my first choice. <laughs> and so we said, you know, you don't have to wait a week. <laughs> no one else is going to take this one, um, and it, no one else did. It's the hangover. Did people choose where they wanted? It? Yeah. Yeah, and we'll, and they either chose it or, and we'll talk a little bit later. They helped the each only requirement. The only requirement was <clears throat> well, requirement which you didn't enforce in a few cases because how can you enforce it? Was you can put it anywhere on your body as long as we can take a picture of it. And we also sometimes told people that we really hope to put to to be able to show this video in Lexington schools. And so we would say hopefully it's not a place that we cannot show in a video in, in a Can school. In well school? with it's zoomed in. When you see the video you'll see that it's zoomed in so you can't uh, tell what part of her body it's on. Uh, it's I mean it's funny as a phrase and potentially like titillating but um, kids, kids, kids don't see that picture. We don't show it to them. And the dregs and the. And we, when we first mentioned this to someone, we said, this is before we talked to the person who covered all the tattoos, um, 
He said, the only problem is Bianca's poem will probably have words like the in it, and no one's going to want the as a tattoo. And his response actually was, that sounds really cool. Not only do I want the, I'm going to give you all the money in my pocket to get this started. It wasn't a whole lot of money. Eleven dollars. He actually offered us twenty-two for our next artwork. Oh, did he? I haven't oh, he's you doubling yet. it. That's mm -hmm. nice. Mm -hmm. So what are these circles? Yeah. We'll tell you about the circles. It's okay. a secret design. Right. <laughs> so and then the the only words we didn't give away, and this kind of, well, this story will kind of tell you a little bit about how wrapped up people got into the project was mm -hmm. the poet's name by Bianca Spriggs, and it a. Uh, an event where people were there to hear her read the poem and we would share some statistics about who got the tattoos. We said these were the only words we didn't give away because we thought Bianca would find it creepy. And she said, I think I'm totally fine with that if somebody wants my name on their body. <laughs> and so, like, I think probably 11 or 12 people's hands shot up in the air trying to be the first person to, to claim it. Um, and we waited a little while and found out that Bianca's mother-in-law wanted to be involved in the project and couldn't. So. This is actually um, her mother-in-law's feet. Mm -hmm. um, shall we talk about the circle? We can tell you about the circles yeah. now. Um, so we um, we wanted these tattoos to be recognizable, so that when you see someone with a text-based mm -hmm. tattoo, you know it's part of this artwork. Our very first idea was to create a special font. <laughs> and then we thought, no, we won't create a font. Well, in fact, the tattoo artist gave us this idea. Mm -hmm. He said, why don't you include, instead of creating a special font, include some kind of a graphic <coughs> element, repeated graphic element, so when you see a, a tattoo that's text and it has this graphic element, you'll know it's part of this artwork. And so we liked the idea. We didn't know what it would be. And we also wanted to read the poem before we came up with this graphic element so it would be more organic, so they were connected. And Bianca's poem is, uh, and you'll hear her read it, uh, it's so based into the built landscape of Lexington, built in also natural landscape. So you hear about different places. Some of them are bars that no longer exist. In fact, the dame, one of the bars, doesn't exist because of this block that was torn down. There is the Elkhorn Creek, which is a river nearby. So a lot of uh, places that basically map out the physical space of Lexington. So, and we really like maps and mapping. And so, we came up with, um, and we can tell you what it is. New Circle Road is a, a major road in Lexington um, where the people use a lot to to talk about um, where they're going or where they live. Um, so. Um, so they'll say, I live within New Circle or outside of New Circle. Or to get there, you have to get past New Circle Road. And so, um, why are you showing that? I think it's the next one we need. So when the circles, <laughs> when they're all assembled, yeah. when all the tattoos are photographed and reassembled, then the circles create this pattern. Mm -hmm. And uh, the image for New Circle Road is a circle with the number four right in the middle. But we wanted to make it a little bit less symmetrical. So we created, um, so this is the background image. It's made of all circles and dots, because it's new circle, circles. And we also like the symbolic meaning of circles, right? The community of people coming together. Wait, uh, how, like, when the, so how the, the process assembled? how the process works is first we begin with this background. We created this background image. Then we overlaid the text of the poem on top of it and basically created chunks. So each piece of text would have some circles and dots oh. as part of it. And then we removed the circles and the dots that in interfered with the letters, because no one would want circles and dots around their letters. And that's how we created the design for each tattoo. So the design is not random circles and dots. They're all part of this bigger image and where the sp your specific word falls within it. Does it make sense? And we kept it a secret. So everyone knew that, that their circles and dots collectively accumulated into an image, but they didn't know what it was. Um, and then we never intended to give away, and can you go back to Hendrik? We never intended to give away the secret image as a, as a tattoo. And so this is Hendrik, and he is also the husband of the poet. And we knew him, when everybody in town knows him, but we, we knew him pretty well because he works at Third Street Staff. You know where that is? He used to work there. Now he works at the brewery. He was snagged away. And so we would, this coffee house is right next to where we teach, so we're there almost every day, and Henrik always says, so what's up? What are you working on? So he always knows. And so when we started the tattoo project, we said to him, so Henrik, do you want a tattoo? And he's like, no. Um, and he said he was saving his back for his first and very big tattoo. And we were like, fine, you know, you can't argue with Henrik because you don't argue with Henrik. <laughs> and also, not everyone wants a tattoo, and that's fine. When we had given all the tattoos away, you know, we happen to be there, and Hendrik says, so 
I want a tattoo. And we said, well, they're all taken, but for you, since you're Bianca's husband and you're Hendrik, um, you can choose any word you want. And we'll t talk about the structure of the poem. We said, you can take any phrase that's, that we've already broken the poem into. It can be yours. And he said, no. He said, I don't want any words. He said, I want the background image, the secret background image, which then was a challenge for us because we, we thought, well, what if he doesn't like it? Because now everyone has these tattoos with the secret background image. People are excited about it. In fact, at every stage of this artwork, this was our fear. What if people don't like the poem? What if they don't like the circles and dots? There are a lot of, well, not a lot, but a few poets who ended up participating. And so we weren't sure if they liked the poems. A few artists participated. One of them specifically works with a lot of circles. And we thought, well, she might hate our circles, but she didn't. And so Hendrik says, I want the secret background image. And we just drawn a napkin, what it looks like, kind of apprehensively, that we would show it to him and he would say, I don't want that on my, on my body. But he really liked it. So he took this in May, and that was less than a year ago. And for six months, it was a secret in town what the secret background image was and who had it as a tattoo. Like people knew both of these things. So eventually, a lot of like, anticipation built up because of that. But that's that's where the circles and dots come from. They come from the secret image, which what is based on. Four again? Um, it's the way New Circle World is designated Route Four. That's what it's called. It's the the the. the so the street route. the street sign for New Circle Road is just a, it's white, a circle white four inside of a blue with, blue circle. Uh, yeah. But also, once we created this, you realized what the Fantastic Four. The Fantastic Four. That it's the same sign as for the Fantastic Four, and I don't know anything about similar to the Fantastic Four. Yes. Sim no, I don't know anything about um, superheroes graphic or novels. Pop so, like, I would have never like realized this. Uh, but but then you were able to tell people we're all superheroes in in Lexington. <laughs> I know it's a superhero. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, th I just want to comment on how amazing the, the organic process was. Mm -hmm. like, this wasn't, you know, the end result wasn't at all the goal. I mean, you just no, start nothing. The project, and there was things yeah, just kind and of that's unfold. yeah, and we're going to talk about a lot of those things because mm -hmm. what happens um, often with our work and with this project more than anything else, I think t to date is that um, you know we invite people to to own the work in, in very different ways, and what that turns into. Sometimes what it turns into is, is responsibility towards the people that, that we are unaware we're going to end up having. Mm -hmm. But also, um, the really exciting part is that people offer suggestions that make the project grow in ways that we could have never predicted. If we can take take all of their suggestions, because some of them we just don't have time to, <laughs> to follow through. But, but OK, so the first time people saw their designs, so you know people had signed up, they, they got they got their choice of words, and then no, most people had not seen the design. So it was a little bit, I mean, a lot of this was nerve-wracking, because at every stage, we would have the same question, will people like this enough to actually participate? We had a meet and greet at which Bianca read her poem for the first time. It was December, Christmas tree there. And so we handed out these sheets of paper, slips of paper, with people's words that they had chosen and were assigned. And then their design. And again, we want really we we didn't have any tattoos at the time, so we weren't sure quite how it worked. But we knew that not everyone would want would get a design for a tattoo and want to have it on their body. So the rule was. So I guess we had another rule. You have to take at least one circle. You can remove as many as you want, but take at least one so it's recognizable as part of this artwork. And you can't move the circles. You can you remove can't, them, but you can't relocate them. can't move them around. And some people asked if they could get more circles. Some people took off some circles. Most of them just kept them as they are. And then what happened is it, simultaneously with our meeting, greet the tattoos hit Facebook. So people photographed them in these fun ways and posted them. They were really excited. And that's when they realized that this, like we had one idea about where this would go, and we just had no idea about all the ways in which people would make these tattoos their own and the whole artwork their own. So it was really exciting. And we didn't capture all of them because we weren't friends with all of them on Facebook, but we captured some of them. Um, and then there were a few naysayers, um, and we'll come back to that later. You know, speaking of stereotypes, like how do we avoid stereotypes? A few naysayers said, like, I can't believe, not many, but they said, like, on Facebook, I can't believe you're letting perfect strangers design your tattoos. And then so what happened then is that people like this guy, Phil Robinson, they posted their pictures like this on Facebook, or just their tattoos on Facebook, and they invited everyone to, to tell them where to put their tattoo. 
because they, they didn't have any tattoos, they didn't know what to do with <laughs> their phrases, uh, and so they they actually asked people to tell them where to give them advice about where to put their tattoos, and so like. Really, at that point, we realized there was this community happening around these tattoos, and not just people who were participating by taking the tattoo, but just people who were aware of the artwork. Um, and so, we'll share some statistics statistics with you, as a, really as a way to illustrate what we found out that people participated for a lot of different reasons. I mean, certainly Lexington and the community were part of it because you couldn't avoid that. It's a poem for Lexington. It's happening in Lexington. But a lot of people did it with uh, people they're already connected to as a way of affirming those kinds of connections and, and, and also finding their own meaning in the words. So the phrase of the universe repeats 28 times. And we'll, show, we'll talk to you about the poem a little bit again. And each time the design is different because of where the words happen to be in the poem. Um, let's see. The and of the universe, yeah. people, you know, mm -hmm. talk about affirming and creating connections. Mm -hmm. They also created their own club. Mm -hmm. They got very excited about having an of the universe <laughs> club. Um, there are 488 words in the poem, including the title. So we gave everything away, including the title and by Bianca Strix, it's 496 words. Uh, we divided them into 220 phrases, which became 222, including the title uh, of the artwork, the Lexington Tattoo Project, and by Bianca Spriggs. We ended up with 253 participants, which is a lot more than we had thought we would have, uh, and a long waiting list. And people still ask us if they can participate. Um, and uh, we've now gotten, well, no, actually, a few times people have asked us what happens when someone dies, you know, what will happen to their tattoo. So we've had to deal with that question as well. And we can tell you about that later. Um, of the 253 people, approximately one third of first timers. And what's really interesting for us and for the tattoo artist is that the average age that the tattoo artist figured is probably around um, 40, mid 40s. So these weren't teenagers doing something rash and stupid, as we tend to think of first time, um, first timers with tattoos, but there are a lot of people who are older than that. Um, and then at one point, we realized a lot of couples were participating together. So we tried to count them um, as well as we could. And we figured that there were about 33 same-sex and heterosexual couples, some of them married, some of them dating, who participated together. This is one of them. And now what's, now we know all these people. When we were starting, we knew maybe about 40 of the people who participated, which was great, because they're not all people like us. So the demographics are um, a lot more diverse than the two of us are. Um, and what's happened, we know all the people, and occasionally people will send us a message to tell us that they've broken up. Because they, they feel like we. I mean, in some ways, it, we really have become like this this big family, um, and they feel that we should know if, if they're no longer together, which we don't know how to respond to because often we don't know them very well. So, I don't know if I should say good for you or I'm really sorry that you're no longer together. You know, so a few people have divorced, but um, yeah, but that it it's interesting because the life of the artwork itself really mirrors all the human connections that became part of it from the very beginning. Kristen and George, um, number of families with a three, at least three people involved from the same family, four. The greatest number of people involved within a single family is five. And we'll show you their picture, the Smith. Um, when they signed up to participate, there were all these people with the last name Smith, and we didn't know they were connected. And it turns out that there were um, two parents and three kids. Number of mother-daughter pairs, five. This is one of them. This is another. Number of mother-son pairs, six. Number of grandmother-grandson pairs, one. <laughs> uh, and then sets of twins, one set of twins participated. Oh, these are brothers, the twins. So on the top of their tattoos, as we gave them to them, we also told people we would prefer that we photograph their tattoos before they embellish them. But then we really love the embellished tattoos as well. So we ended up taking pictures of them as well. And so we photographed them once they embellished their tattoos. And then, so many, many ways in which the artwork grew in ways that we could not have anticipated. Uh, this is on Dean Quinn. We knew her a little bit before before she participated. It turns out she, she, has, she has a blog. And so before, she, when she got her design for through her work from, as part of this artwork, she already had two tattoos, and she created a blog post talking about the meaning of each of her tattoos to her. 
So if any of you have a tattoo, you probably know that tattoos come with stories. It makes sense, but we just hadn't thought about it very much. And so she wrote about each of her tattoos, including what, why she chose through. Um, and we saw it and we asked if she, if she would mind if we shared it on, on the Facebook event page. And she said that was fine. And so we shared it. And a lot of people chimed in saying that they really wanted to share their own stories, wh why they chose their words. And we knew that if we didn't create a venue for them to do that, um, they would do it anyway, but we would not be able to see their stories. And so because of Ondine, we ended up creating a website. Um, and the website is, um, I think, the next one, LexingtonTattooProject.com. And it has a blog. And on the blog, uh, for we've, we kept it going for a year. Now we're focusing on the Boulder Tattoo Project. But for a year on the Lexington Tattoo Project uh, blog, we would post a picture of a person and his or her tattoo and then the story that they sent us of what their words mean to them. This is my tattoo, T. Proofs. And this is not a tattoo on the top. It's, she, it's pretty clear, but... She's not yeah. that proud of the yeah. Um So in terms of ways, um, you know, you mentioned ways the project grew organically. Um, one, of the, one of the things we knew from the very beginning was the pro one product would be a video. And a person that was kind of connected with the project early on said, well, you're going to need a title shot for that video, and it should be a tattoo that says Election Tattoo, tattoo Project. And, um, of course, we thought that was a great idea, but, you know, all the other phrases, people can make their own in some way. This, nobody can really make their own. It, it is what it is. And so we didn't know who, if anyone would be interested, but we decided to display this at one of the meet and greets where Bianca read her poem for the first time and say, anyone who's interested in this tattoo, um, put your name in this hat. And we were hoping for one name, and then we would pretend there were a lot in there and <laughs> pull it out. But um, turns out almost 60 people put their names in the hat with a tattoo. And, and this man's name was drawn. His name is Kenny Delver. He wasn't involved in the project yet, which was great. So we get one more participant. And um, you know, kind of the whole story of his, his, of his participation became interesting because um, we designed the tattoos and delivered them to the tattoo artists at the same exact scale so that they would know if people like the size of Kremena's tattoo, they would know that that was shrunk to 70%. So it could really accelerate the process for the tattoo artists. Um, so when we designed Kenny's, you know, we printed that out and the design is this big. And we had to dis decide, like, do we shrink this down because we know Kenny wants it on his shoulders and his shoulders aren't that big. Um, Kenny's a built he saw that, we decided not to shrink it for the sake of the tattoo artists. Um, he showed up and he saw it, and rather than even once thinking about shrinking it, he said, well, that's going to wrap all the way around. My, that's bigger than my back. And the tattoo artist said, it's going to have to go around your ribs, and that's really going to hurt. And so Kenny said, well, I think my leg is long enough. And it was. And then he said, uh, is it okay if I just wear my underwear for this tattoo? Because I didn't, you know, I was playing on my back, I don't have shorts, and Tattoo artist said, that's fine. So Kenny went into the bathroom, stayed out his pants, come out in his underwear, and he came back out with his pants on and said, you know, I'm sorry, guys, it's laundry day, and I don't have any underwear on. <laughs> <laughs> and in, in what at the time was really surprising, but in the end it's not surprising at all, um, three tattoo artists and two men who were getting tattoos in the shop kind of all together said the same thing, which was, you know, man, if it's okay with you, I'll loan you my underwear. <laughs> And uh, thankfully, I think for Kenny, um, he was there with a woman, a, a friend of his, who had two skirts on. And she just took one of her skirts off and he wore that. So in the beginning of the video, you'll see Kenny getting his tattoo with a skirt on. Mm -hmm. This is um, one of the other events that came out of a suggestion was a essentially magnetic poetry mashup with Twister, where people thought it would be great to see each other's finished tattoos and to try to create new poems just by lining up their, their words. And th the reason we're showing this one isn't because they made a fantastic poem. This is the Smith family. So this is the family of five. The baby does not have a tattoo, um, but it's featured in the, in the movie as well. <laughs> and then at the end, we, um, at some point, uh, two participants in the, well, Many people said once we started the blog, you know, this should really be a book. And we had known all along it could be a book and that we didn't have time. And so when people would ask us if it was going to be a book, that was kind of our response, is that maybe someday in the future there'll be a book, but we don't have time now. And there were two people, participants in the project, who called us with a different way of approaching it and said, 
we just had brunch together, and we're going to publish the book for you. You know, we're going to make this financially possible. And so we said, that's great, because we had tons of time, <laughs> um, which we didn't. And doing it was, uh, it was a, a major undertaking. But when we were trying to figure out what cover, what image would be on the cover, that became a bit of a challenge because there's all kinds of, you know, who do you use to represent the entire project? How, how do you pull that off? And my response is, um, you know, I come from traditional art school training, and so my response is, that's easy. I choose the best image. And I knew exactly which one that was, and Carmena had some different and wrong opinion. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was aware of things like race and class and, and a lot of other things, and that representation is difficult. So and and so, uh, we so did, we negotiated. Yeah, we did what Bianca did in the beginning. We went to yeah. Facebook. We chose images that would work with the phrase and with the kind of composition of the image, and we put eight on Facebook and to the Internet and in general online, and asked people yeah. to vote. So the participants voted and people from around the world voted because by that time we had some CNN coverage and a lot of people following so these were the eight images that we chose, um, or to, to choose from, and in the end, in the was the one that. Yeah. So this is what the book became. Yeah. And so um, before we show the video, we'll um, kind of share two of the stories that kind of come with the project. Um, Fine. And we'll go to the video and um, talk about other things. So one of the we started with this picture. This is Ann Brown, and we also mentioned Karen mentioned the grandmother and grandson team. So this is Ann and her grandson Jake, and you already saw Jake as well. He's one of the 28 people that says of the universe. And her um, story that she submitted, she says, "I see spirits. They come to my house like it's a bus stop and stay. And I met so many people waiting to go to their destiny, heaven. I hope. All they want is to send a message." or they just are not ready to leave, so they hang out at my house like a big family, just waiting at my house like it's a waiting room. And when I came to this project, it was for me and my grandson, something we could share. When I'm gone, he can look back at his tattoo and say, me and Granny did this together. I'm very close to my grandson, Jake Turpin. And the other, the other, the other story, and there are a lot more stories, but it's these two women, Nancy and Lisa, um, and so we told you there are a number of couples who participated. We actually met Nancy and Lisa when Heracut came to town to paint their murals. Nancy and Lisa, we didn't know them. They happened by one of the murals first, and they would come and check it out two days in a row. And then they either they took vacation or they happened to be on vacation. By the time we moved to the second mural, they were the ones who brought a picnic blanket and a cooler with beer, and they just camped out. And we, like, we became really close. We all became really close to each other, but we became close to them. So we're starting this other artwork. It's, it's. We can. We we asked them. They didn't have any tattoos. I wasn't even going to ask them to participate because I didn't want to put any pressure on them. But Kurt did, and they they did. They signed up to participate, um, and they've they've been great. We've become even closer to them. They split the phrase "drift to short street," um, and um, we were excited that we were able to accommodate that um, that choice. So here is their story. Nancy wrote it and sent it to us. On a Thursday night in 2002, I was taking a break outside the side entrance of Cheapside Bar and Grill, where I was laying on a pallet of bagged ice that had just been delivered. I was taking a break from my chef duties, cooling down, when Lisa House walked up and said hi. I had not laid eyes on her in years. I said, you must be going to Thursday Night Live. And she said, you must be working hard. I said, always. We talked and laughed and smiled a lot, and I told her I had to get back to work. I could not get her out of my head. Every Thursday night from then on, I would browse the crowd in the hopes of seeing her again. I did see her again, but I was, of course, slammed in the kitchen, so I could not talk. Then one night, Lisa drifted to Short Street and came inside Cheapside. It just so happened that I had just finished for the evening. Robbie Bartlett Bull's band was playing, so we danced the night away. Eleven years later, here we are with our very first tattoos, with the words that mean so much to us. So that's another story that actually is connected to Short Street, which is the place, um, Cheapside Bar and Grill is there, so you know about that. Um, and we'll show you the video. So all along, this is the one thing that we knew we were going to create, uh, a video. And back to this question, how do you, how do you 
create a portrait that doesn't reinforce stereotypes. We hope that it doesn't, um, but when CNN published an article about the Lexington Tattoo Project, yeah, there were a number of people who wrote short, you know, stupid, like stupid Southerners with tattoos. You know, and, and how do you respond to that? And, and we didn't respond, people responded saying this, this really is about community and about love for community. Did it convince any of those people saying stupid people with tattoos? Um, probably not, but uh, some people will just not be convinced. Hey, but Kurt, anyhow, Kurt. Oh, yeah. We should talk about fans. Sorry, is there a link for the video online that we can watch, uh, or is it a private video? Um, it's a private video currently. Um, we'll just make it work. We'll just turn the camera towards the screen then. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, in this case, yeah. Um, so one more thing. Uh, there's music in the video. Initially, the one thing we knew we wanted to do was ask Bianca to write a poem, and she, she reads and writes beautifully and have her read the poem, and basically you can see the words of the poem through people's tattoos. That's what we started. And then before the tattooing even um, had begun, we went to a concert by a local musician, Ben Suli, who is a cellist, uh, and he's a classical musician by training, but he plays the cello with a lot of twists. So we went to this concert, and, and he it was a fundraiser for um, Institute 193, which is a local gallery. And at that concert, he talked a lot about the importance of community collaboration in Lexington to him. And so then I wrote an email to Kurt saying, we should ask him to compose the score for our video, because our video is about community collaboration in Lexington. And Kurt said, um, Ben Sully is too big for us. Uh, you know, and I said, no, we're too big for him. <laughs> so anyhow, we asked him, and he said yes, which was great. So the music that you hear there is Ben Sully's music. And there are three parts to it. So when it goes black, there's more. So I should look at the poem. Yeah. So the poem is a contrapunto. And anyone who is familiar with that form, the way it works is you read Bianca will read this part of the poem first, which is a narrative poem, and then she'll read the right side of the poem as a list poem. And then a third part of the video, it will kind of re like a, a mashup of both parts together. So the kind of the structure and the narrative of the story changes. Mm -hmm. So the third poem undermines the first one in some very fun ways. How long is it? Eight minutes. Oh. Beyond midnight, when she showed up at his back door and asked him to take her on a ride through back rooms out past Elkhorn Creek, it would be just like the night she wore a neon wig and her favorite leopard print 